In this video, we're going to see how the four Maxwell's equations that describe light can actually be combined into one single equation. Allow me to introduce two cat brothers, Rumi and Marlo, who will be asking questions on your behalf. Oh, by the way, Rumi just got a second fan last week following the first one from two weeks ago. We are incredibly grateful. Right now, all we can offer to our members is a badge and a few emojis. But you guys still chose to join and support us. And that truly means a lot to us. It gives us so much strength. We'll keep going with full confidence that one day this channel will hit a million subscribers. Once again, huge thanks to AG-Man and Terasi. I even told Rumi your names, so he knows you guys. And sorry Marlo, I haven't made your membership tier yet. But don't worry, you'll get your own soon. Marlo is Rumi's younger brother. Okay, before we get started, I'd highly recommend watching this Laplace equation and Poisson equation video first, because I'll be using the vector identities we learned there quite a lot in this one. In the previous videos, we covered all four of Maxwell's equations. These equations are also known as the equations of light, because together, they describe the electric and magnetic fields, which combine to form the electromagnetic field, and that electromagnetic field is what most people simply call light. To combine the four equations into a single equation, we need to formulate them in terms of potentials instead of fields. I already explained how the fields relate to the potentials in the Faraday's law video, right? And we should be able to make that transition. Actually, two of the four Maxwell's equations are already kind of built into the way we define the electric field and the magnetic field using potentials. The divergence of a vector being zero automatically means it can also be written as a curl of another vector. So the second Maxwell's equation is already built into this definition. Also, if you just take the curl of E using this definition, the curl of the gradient of a scalar is always zero, and the curl of A equals B, so we are left with this, which is exactly the third Maxwell's equation. So these two definitions by themselves already represent Maxwell's second and third equations. Now let's try plugging our electric field definition into Maxwell's first equation, like this. The divergence of the gradient of a scalar is just Laplacian, the second order derivatives, and again, d over dt and the divergence symbol are exchangeable, so I can say d over dt of the divergence of a. The equation looks a bit more complicated, but it's fine for now. I'll assign the Roman numeral 1 and come back to this a little later. Now let's look at the fourth Maxwell's equation. Again, we use these two definitions for the field. I don't think I've shown this identity before, but there's another proven vector identity that talks about the curl of the curl of a vector. So according to that, we'll have this expression. And after expanding this bracket term, we could move everything except for mu naught j to the left-hand side. Then I'll just group the four terms like this. I'll assign the Roman numeral 2 to this equation. Take your time and make sure you're following along up to this point. Okay, so I've brought the two expressions here. All of four Maxwell's equations are now packed into these two expressions. All of them checkmarked. Now, if you look at them, both expressions contain the divergence of A. I did mention that the curl of the vector potential gives us the magnetic field, but I don't think I ever talked the divergence of the vector potential, right? When Maxwell came up with his four equations, people back then didn't really fully understand the vector potential, so they kind of just made educated guesses. And one of the most popular assumptions was to simply set it to zero. Why? Because if you plug that into the first expression, all of a sudden, it turns into the simple Poisson equation. And since Poisson's equation is definitely one of the fundamental equations describing nature, people thought this was a very reasonable assumption. And in fact, it did make many related equations in electromagnetism work out quite nicely. But now, Oh wow, this other equation looks a bit messy instead. 
You know what? Let's talk about this Poisson's equation first. The mathematical solution to this equation is this. You can derive it by applying Green's function. But did you know that this equation is actually for the electrostatic case? In electrostatics, you can exactly predict the scalar potential just by measuring the electric field, no matter where you are. Because everything is static and nothing will change. But in electrodynamics, if you are far away from the charge and that charge suddenly changes, like in here it got bigger, it'll take time for the new electric field to reach you. If this equation were for electrodynamics, then as soon as this charge density changes, you would instantly measure the changed potential value. Say you were 100 meters away from the charge, so just plug in 100 here for R and you'll get the new potential value, right? But will your measuring device actually notice the change like you? No, if it does, that would be a violation of special relativity because nothing can travel faster than the speed of light. So this Poisson's equation is for electrostatic case. I can actually prove this to you. Recall Maxwell's first equation. See what I did here? I got Poisson's equation by saying that E is the negative gradient of V. And that condition was only for electrostatics, remember? So in electrostatics, we use this definition for the electric field. Oh, and also if you think about it, this del operator is basically a derivative operator. So if you take the derivative of V, you'll get the expression of the electric field from Coulomb's law, which is again for electrostatics, right? In electrodynamics, we have this additional term that compensates for the fact that del V by itself violates special relativity. So in electrodynamics, we must consider this additional term. This should make more sense. So if we set the divergence of A to 0, first equation becomes Poisson's equation, which does simplify things a lot. But we'll have to accept that it limits us to the electrostatic case. OK, so instead of setting it to 0, let's consider something else. Like Marlow said, the second expression also looks tricky to solve anyway. Hmm, Ludwig Lorentz, a Danish physicist, came up with something else. Let's have a look. Um, this looks a bit more complicated than the previous one. But anyway, let's take a look at the second one too. Aha, uh -huh. maybe Ludwig was trying to cancel these two terms. And yeah, the second one definitely looks simpler than the previous version. But hold on, I don't think the cancellation in the second equation was the only thing he was aiming for. I mean, look at both equations together. Didn't you notice something? First of all, his method not only separated the two types of potentials, V and A, but also made the two equations look similar. So, what do you guys think, Romy and Marlo? Rumi just asked a really important question. Both methods seem to have their pros and cons, but are we even allowed to define the divergence of A however we like? Because what if they result in different electric field and magnetic field? The answer is, we're actually allowed, just with a few conditions. And we will still get the same electric field and magnetic field from both options, don't worry. And how is it possible? Get ready. You're about to learn one of the most interesting ideas in physics. Our main concern right now is whether defining the potentials differently still gives us the same electric and magnetic fields. I'm mentioning here again, I'll be bringing up vector identities as I explain things to you. So if you're not familiar with vector identities, make sure to check out this video first before moving on, okay? Alright, so first thing, we gotta make sure these two pairs of potentials are really different from each other. So let V prime and A prime differ from V and A by beta and alpha respectively. If we want to get the same magnetic field, then this second term has to be zero, right? And according to a vector identity, if the curl of a vector is zero, that vector can be written as the gradient of some scalar function. 
let's call that scalar function lambda. Now, if we do the same thing for the electric field definition, we see that these two terms together have to be zero as well, right? And instead of alpha, if we plug in del lambda, we can rewrite the expression like this. So then beta must be negative d lambda over dt. Make sense? Because since the right hand side is zero, we can remove the del operator and that gives us that result. All right, so what we just did is, if we add the gradient of some scalar function to the vector potential a, and at the same time adjust v by subtracting d lambda over dt from it, then these new potentials a prime and v prime will give us the same electric and magnetic fields as the original a and v. That's the crazy part. Let's check if we really get the same electric field. Take a look. The new potentials didn't affect the electric field, right? Now the magnetic field. This one as well. We still get the same magnetic field. So this means that there can be different potential pairs that give us the same electric and magnetic field. All right, let's take a look at what Ludwig Lohans suggested for the divergence of A and see if it's really okay to use that alternative option. I know he didn't suggest an alpha, but rather the divergence of alpha, so it might not seem clear at first, but follow me. So let's replace that with the del lambda, because alpha corresponds to del lambda, and the lambda term becomes Laplacian. Now, Take the time derivative on both sides, then we'll get this. But like I said, if we're adding del lambda to the vector potential, we should also subtract d lambda over dt from the scalar potential, right? So since the d lambda over dt corresponds to the additional scalar potential, I have the negative sign here, so v prime is like v plus the additional v, then the expression becomes this and just rearrange them to look nicer. Aha! Uh -huh. We get the same expression like this, but it equals zero. So no effect on the original expression in the green box. No matter how many additional terms we have with this definition, they won't affect our expressions inside the green boxes. So both options are correct. It's just that one is preferred in the electrostatic case, while the other is a bit more complicated but works in the general case and they each have names. This one is called the Coulomb gauge. You can probably guess why, right? Because it's for the electrostatic case. And this one is called Lorentz gauge. And yeah, it's pretty obvious why that name was used too. Why do we call them gauges? Good question, Marlo. You've seen this before, right? Things that show pressure or a car speed or your weight. This measuring instrument with a dial or a scale are called gauges. For example, say this gauge measures the weight of this box. If you want to read in kilograms, you look at the numbers on the bottom. If you want to read it in pounds, you look at the numbers on the top. But whether you're using the pound gauge or the kilogram gauge, the actual weight of the box doesn't change, right? That is the idea. It's just like using different values for the divergence of A, but you're not changing the physics of the field. So that's why they're called gauges. And we say that the electric field and the magnetic field are gauge invariant quantities. We managed to compress Maxwell's four equations into two equations by expressing them in terms of potentials. But you know what? If we choose the Lorentz gauge, we can take it a step further and combine those two equations into a single equation. Let's see how that is possible. In our four-dimensional world, any vector could be expressed in something called a four-vector. This is a four-potential vector. Physicists realized that if you divide the scalar potential by the speed of light, it suddenly becomes the time component of the vector potential. And you see this upper index mu? That's a label for each element. So a0, a1, a2, and a3, okay? They're just labels, they're not exponents. And this is a four-current vector. When the charge density is multiplied by the speed of light, it becomes the time component of the current density. 
Just like that, we can also define the four spatial dimension by taking time and multiplying by the speed of light. Since speed times time gives distance, you can now think of time as just another space dimension. And these are called four position vectors. Using these four position vectors, we can extend the usual three-dimensional Laplacian operator to include time as a fourth dimension, then define a four-dimensional Laplacian-like operator. Why does the covariant vector have a negative sign on the first element? That has something to do with Lorentz transformation and Minkowski metric. I might explain that in another video. But for now, just know that we have defined a four-dimensional Laplacian, also called Dallon-Bercian, using these four position vectors. Alright, so this equation should be this. First, let's consider what happens when the index mu is zero. So we pick a0 and j0 elements from here. Since c squared is 1 over epsilon naught mu naught, we end up with this expression. Look, we got one of the two Maxwell's equations written in terms of the potentials. I just flipped all the signs here. Alright, this time we consider the cases where the index mu equals 1, 2, and 3. These are the spatial components, so we can just write them as vectors. We easily arrive at this expression, which is the other one of the two Maxwell's equations, written in terms of the potentials. Alright, so that was it. So this one equation actually contains all four of Maxwell's equations. It fully describes the electromagnetic field. Let there be light. If you like this video, please like and subscribe to our channel. It really motivates me. And if you want to support this channel, you could also join as our channel member. Thanks.